So again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, this event is sponsored by the Senior Citizen Lecture Series, the Sociology and Criminal Justice Department, the Honors Program, the Department of Economics, History, and Political Science, Communication Arts, the Center for Crime and Popular Culture, and American Studies, so a lot of different groups on campus, and we really appreciate everybody um, supporting this event. Our speaker today is Jerry Mitchell. I'm very excited to have him here uh, from Mississippi. Uh, he is the founder of the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, he's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant and a number of other awards. Uh, and he is the author of Race Against Time, A Reporter Reopens the Unsolved Murder Cases of the Civil Rights Era, which if you are not aware is getting rave reviews everywhere from New York Times to this morning, the Wall Street Journal. Um, the books are being sold outside so you can pick one up, uh, and he will be signing after the event. So uh, you can have him sign your book as well, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you. Is this on? Does this work? Okay, great. Uh, a few commercials before I start, because I got, I got some friends here. Um, and uh, probably some of you are, I'm sure all, a lot of you already know. Uh, this is, uh, Dave Goodman is here, and um, you know, and so his family has just put out this book called Justice on the Walls, which is fantastic. This is uh, another artwork here, Mom and Dad on the Walls, which is, um, uh, if you ever got the, the the honor of being able to tour the house, which I did, this is, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, and then Bernice Sims is with us as well, who knows these, this story intimately, and so she has a book herself, uh, Detour Before Midnight, so both these are available now, so uh, I want to make y'all aware of those books. Uh, um, but, uh, I, you know, don't have a ton of time, you know, I, I, I usually take like 45 minutes to just begin to tell all these stories, but I'm going to talk about two cases. Uh, I will tell you about the cover, just because sometimes I get questions about this. Um, this is a, a photograph of, uh, it's kind of horrific really, it's a photograph of the station wagon. So James Cheney and Andrew Goodman uh, and, uh, and Mickey Schwerner were basically going to investigate a fire. Uh, a black church was burned down by the Klan and they were going to investigate. And so they were then arrested, you know, on purpose because then they were released into the hands of Klansmen who then killed them and buried their bodies down 15 feet in an earthen dam. Weren't found for 44 days. Pretty much the nation's attention was captured by that. But a few days later, they found the station wagon they had been driving around in and it had been burned. They tried to destroy it, but they did burn the station wagon, but they all, the FBI found it a few days later. And that's just actually, to my knowledge, never been published before, but it's from the FBI files. This is the, uh, this is a photograph of that station wagon. And uh, anyway, just, anyway, I, anyway it's, I just feel honored to be here to talk to you, humbled, and I've got some friends here, which is great, and great to be with y'all. Um, I don't know if you're like me, but if someone tells me I can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. Anybody else like that? Am I the only one? Yeah, I got a few more. You should be re all be reporters like me, right? And uh, so there was something in Mississippi called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. And it was a state segregationist spy agency, which may be kind of hard to imagine. But it was kind of like the state equivalent of the White Citizens Council, if you've ever heard about that or read about that. It basically had ten, kind of two arms. One was a propaganda arm where they sent white and black speakers to places like New York City and said, oh, we love segregation. We love the way things are in Mississippi. And then they kind of had a spy arm where they infiltrated civil rights groups, uh, smeared civil rights workers, you know, uh, one of the interesting things that they did, and I discovered this, was they actually had a spy who went into uh, 
what they called a COFO, a Council of Federated Organizations is what that stood for, which was basically a combined organization, or umbrella organization for the civil rights groups in Mississippi, which was the Congress of Racial Equality, which, which uh, Mickey had, uh, had come down to be a, be a part of, and then, uh, and then you had the, the NAACP, you had the, the, you know, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and then you had SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which by the way is having their 60th anniversary this year, which is pretty cool. And uh, so anyway, Mississippi had this organization, it was finally disbanded officially in 1977. Um, and, uh, and so what the legislature did, there were more than 132,000 pages of spy files on more than 10,000 people. And what they did with those files, they sealed them all for 50 years. And when I found that out, I was like, well, there's got to be something in there, right? You know, they wouldn't be sealing them for 50 years unless they're trying to cover up for somebody and conceal something. So I began to develop sources who had access to the files, began, began to leak me those files. And, uh, and what they show was at the same time, uh, this guy, whose name is on the left there, Byron D. LeBeckwith, <coughs> same time that he was being prosecuted for the murder of Meg Revers, this other arm and state, the Sovereignty Commission, was secretly assisting the defense, trying to get Beckwith acquitted. And uh, nobody knew that. And that story ran October 1st of 1989. I do want to tell just a little bit more about Meg Revers. Uh, I assume most people have heard of him. Maybe you haven't. But if you haven't, I, I want to just tell a little bit about him. He was a, he fought in War II, fought in Normandy, uh, and then returned home to fight racism all over again in the form of Jim Crow that barred African Americans from restaurants, restrooms from voting booths and so he ended up he applied to attend the university uh, let me say one more thing about the about the African Americans returning from war you know sometimes when you read history books they will say that the modern civil rights movement began with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 when schools were began to be you know were ordered to be segregated they weren't desegregated at that point but Actually, I think it began earlier. I think it began with these African Americans who returned from war. They fought for their country, and they came home and said, you know, we fought for our country. We should have the same rights as other citizens had. And that, I think, is, of course, this is what Meg Revers did and many others. And I think that's really, at least in Mississippi, that's what really began the civil rights movement in Mississippi, which was very active before Brown versus Board of Education ever happened. Um, so, um, but he was killed, uh, shot in the back, on the same night that President Kennedy told the nation, President Kennedy's first civil rights speech, and he told the nation that the grandsons of slaves were still not free. And so, he was killed in his own driveway, shot in the back. And his wife and children ran outside, saw the blood, saw him scream. And he died about a year later. As I mentioned, I wrote a story about this in 1989, October 1st of 89. At the time I wrote the story, the odds were literally more than a million to one against the case ever being reopened and re-prosecuted. Um, there was, you know, nothing in the court files of any kind of value that I could find, like eight or nine pages, but nothing of any value. There was, uh, there was no court transcript. There was no safety deposit box, you know, nothing. Um, and so, um, but Merle Evers believed and she prayed and some amazing things happened. A couple of months later, Jackson police are cleaning out a closet happened to find the box that contained the crime scene photographs of the killing of Meg Rivers, including the fingerprint of Byron D. LeBeck which lifted from the murder weapon. A few months after that, Merle ever shared with me her copy of the court transcript that she had saved in a safety deposit box. 
And a few months after that, the prosecutor in the case found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet, which sounds like I'm making it up, I know, but really, this is why I like nonfiction. Uh, anyway, and so, uh, so I went to interview Mr. Beckwood. You can probably figure out how I found his house. <laughs> Pretty, he literally, I mean, this was not just for the photo. He had this flying outside his, his home. Uh, and so I went to interview him, uh, spent about six hours with him, absolutely the most racist person I ever spent serious time with. Inward this, inward that, and they started in all the other non-white races. He was really, really anti-Semitic. He was a part of what's called Christian identity. Has anybody heard of Christian identity? We got a few folks that have heard of Christian identity. Okay, this is a primer on Christian identity. I'm telling you very bluntly and rudely what they believe, okay? So don't think I'm, you know, this is horrible and offensive and racist. So, you know, that, with that understanding, I'll tell you real quickly. They, this is what they teach and believe. They believe that Adam and Eve were white people. They believe that non-white races were created on the sixth day with the animals and therefore have no souls and call them mud people. And they uh, believe that Eve had sex with Satan the serpent and that's where Jews come from. They literally believe this. Ridiculous, I know, I know. I'm just telling you this is what they literally believe. And he believed and he told me all about it. Uh, so, you know, sometimes when you spend time with certain people, you feel like by the end of the conversation, you need to have a bath. <laughs> this was one of those times. So I, I, it was starting to get dark, and I felt like it was a good, you know, I needed to go. And uh, so he insisted on like walking me out to my car, and I'm like, really? Yeah, that's okay, I, I think I can find my way. So he gets me out to the car anyway and says, if you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you. If you write negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. And so his wife and made me a sandwich. <laughs> I think you can guess what I did with the sandwich. So... Byron D. LeBeck with, uh, was indicted for the murder of Meg Rivers. And, and uh, at the time I went up and talked to him, he didn't realize that I was the one that wrote the story that got the case reopened. Remember, this was pre-internet, right? He didn't know. Because I passed his quiz, you know, which was, you know, you know, are, you know, where do you grow up? What are your parents' names? Where do you go to church? You know, all those kind of questions. And you know, I, I'm pretty much a, grew up a Southern wasp. So I mean, you know, I passed with flying colors. So he, he invited me up. But by the time he got, you know, indicted and then fought extradition all this time, he figured out that I'd written the story. And uh, so when he when came back to Mississippi after losing his extradition battle, he saw me cross the court and he goes, you see that boy over there? When he dies, he's going to Africa. <laughs> and I turned to my friend I went, I always wanted to go to Africa <laughs> so Byron Neal Beckwith was convicted on February 5th, 1994 in the exact same courtroom that he had been tried in almost 30 years to the day and when the word guilty rang out you could hear the waves of joy as they cascaded down the hall until it reached a four-year full of people, black and white, just erupted in cheers. And I just felt chills because the impossible had suddenly become possible. And Murdley Evers and her daughter, Rena, cheered as well. Um, not too long after Byron D. Lebeck was indicted, I got a phone call from this family. This is Ellie Damer and she's holding a photograph for her late husband, Vernon Damer. And I, I know some of y'all actually have been privileged to meet the Damer family and uh, 
Uh, what an amazing family. Um, so Vernon Daniel was a farmer, a businessman, NAACP leader. He fought his whole life for the right of all Americans to be able to vote. Klan didn't like that. Attacked him and his family in the middle of the night, January 10th, 1966. Imagine this, you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, your house is on fire, and you hear gunshots coming into your house. And so Vernon Damer grabbed a shotgun, and ran in front of the house, began firing back at the Klan, and so his family could escape safely out a back window. Unfortunately, the flames of the fire seared his lungs, and he died later that day. A few weeks later, the mail came, his voter registration card. He fought his whole life for the right of all Americans to be able to vote, but never been able to cast a ballot himself. And here's another interesting detail about that family. Six of the seven sons in that family served in our armed forces, a total of 78 years. And four of them were serving in the military at the time of this attack. They were you know, off in foreign countries and wherever, defending their their own country, home country, but no one was defending their home. And so four of them were in the military at the time, and this is what they returned home to see. Um, the guy who ordered this attack was this guy. His name is Sam Bowers, head of the White Knights of the KKK, responsible for at least 10 killings in Mississippi. Um, he's also the one who ordered uh, the killings of Cheney Goodman Shorn in, in the Shelby County in Mississippi as well. But the, the White Knights were the most violent clan organization responsible for at least 10 killings. Um, Bowers had been tried for this case before but never been convicted. And so um, anyway, not too long after I met with the Damer family, they in turn met with the district attorney. He acted interested but got cold feet. Uh, really didn't really <laughs> do anything. Well, he had excuses for everything. Like he said, well, I don't have an investigator. So then I wrote about it. Mississippi legislature gave an investigator. And it was like, well, I don't have the FBI records. So I wrote an article about how the FBI wouldn't share the records with him. And the FBI gave him the records. So, and, and then he they had another excuse after that. So, um, so he ended up leaving office and another guy came in and it looked like nothing was going to happen. Uh, this guy didn't express any interest in the, in the case at all. And so uh, I ended up, it looked like nothing was going to happen. And so I ended up getting this opportunity, a fellowship, to go to Ohio State and get my master's free of charge, which I thought was a pretty good deal. And so I'm literally in Ohio in the spring of 1997 when I get a telephone call from this guy who wouldn't identify himself, but he said, he uh, had information in the Vernon Damer case and wanted to meet me. So I flew back to Mississippi, and it was me, it was uh, Jerry Hummelstein of the Anti-Defamation League, it was two sons of Vernon Damer, and it was the guy and a buddy of his. I'm not sure how many guns were there that day, but there were, <laughs> there were more than a few. And uh, so we talked, and anyway, he's, he started uh, telling this story about how he used to work for Sam Bowers. He had actually helped, used to type up the Klan propaganda that was passed out. He helped pass it out. And he also remembered uh, Bowers giving the orders to kill Vernon Damon. So he came forward to us, and then obviously, not long after that, he told the story again to the district attorney's office. So then the Basically, the case got reopened in earnest at that point. The guy who'd been the key witness back in the 1960s had been this guy, his name was Bill Leroy Pitts. Bill Leroy Pitts was involved in the killing of Vernon Davis, dropped his gun, got caught, plead guilty to murder, got a life sentence for that, plead guilty to federal charges, and got five years for that. So I was just researching how much time he actually did because a lot of these guys, you know, their sentences were commuted or their you know, the governor pardoned him. You know, you don't hear people pardoning people, do you? Anyway, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that kind of stuff was going on. And, you know, so none of the guys that were involved in the killings actually spent any kind of serious time in prison because they just, you know, they got freed. 
And so I was trying to find about him, and what I've been told, because I couldn't find a record of his state time, what I've been told was he went into the Federal Witness Protection Program. And so I'm talking to the archivist at the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Washington, and she pulled his file. I said, now how much time did he actually spend in prison? She said three and a half years. I said, now I understand he left federal prison and went into the Witness Protection Program. And she said, that's impossible. So what are you talking about? So there was no witness protection program back then. So what this meant was Bill Roy Pitts had never served a single day of his life since Mississippi. Kind of a big oversight, right? So, um, so I, uh, so I didn't know if the, where this guy was. He's alive. He's dead. You know, where he was. This is the relatively early days of the internet now. But I knew there was a one website I knew about that you didn't have to know what city or state they lived in. And so I typed it in. And up it popped. Bill Roy Pitts had his address, Denham Springs, Louisiana, had his telephone number. So I called him. First 20 minutes of the conversation went like this. How'd you find me? How'd you find me? I'm like, it's on the internet. <laughs> the internet, I can list a telephone number. Like, I guess you have to take it up with them. And so as a result of my story that he had never served a single day of his life since Mississippi authorities issued a warrant for his arrest, um, he didn't like that. Um, in fact, he ran. And while he was on the run, he sent me this audio cassette and when he got it, when I got it, I played it and this is how it began. Jerry, I just thought I'd let you know you've ruined my life. But I promise if I, Talk to anybody, I talk to you. So here's this tape on this tape he proceeds to tell me all was involved in killing Vernon Dane or all was involved in all this other clan violence. So shortly after this he shortly after this he turn, turned himself into authorities, and this now leads to the arrest of Sam Bowers. Um, also arrested was this right hand guy, his name was Devers Nix. And Devers was the head up, and I swear I'm not making this up, the clan bureau of investigation. Some of this is funny. It's okay to laugh. You know, some of this is funny. Um, and so when the family brought Devers Nix in, it was like the most pitiful sight you've ever seen. They wheeled him in in the wheelchair with the oxygen tank and they wheeled him up in front of the judge and he's like, I can't take more than a couple steps without needing oxygen, judge. The judge is like, well, I normally don't do this. But I'm gonna let you out without bond. A dozen days later, this is like a reporter's dream. This is where we caught him. <laughs> <laughs> so he got arrested. Yeah, he loved me. Um, so fast forward now. Sam Bowers is going on trial for uh, for killing, you know, ordering attack on Vernon Damer. And guess who's there to testify on his behalf? But Devers Nix, the golfer. And uh, so he, anyway, so Devers Nix is getting ready to testify as kind of a character witness. And he's getting ready to get up there. Of course, this is a tricky situation because he's charged with the exact same crime. And you, I know you know Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Uh, and so his lawyer's trying to work out a signaling system with him, you know, because you could, you can take it on the witness stand too. You can take the fifth. And so, the, his, to tell you real quickly about his lawyer, didn't really, he was a really good criminal defense lawyer back in the 1960s, but by now the guy's in his 80s, and that's great. But the few details about that you need to know, which is they actually brought him from the nursing home to the courtroom. So he's trying to work out this signaling system, you know, with, with his client. He says, now Devers, when you get up there, if you need to take the fifth, I'm gonna raise my hand. Devers like, okay, okay. So Devers gets up, starts testifying, and look over his lawyer about five minutes later, you can probably guess this part. It was like this. <laughs> so Devers kept right on testifying. Yeah, I was in the clan. And you try to put a positive spin on it like there is one. Well, the Klan was a benevolent organization passing out fruit baskets to the needy at Christmas. So under 
So under cross-examination, the prosecutor got and said, Hi, oh, Mr. Nix, just how many fruit baskets did you pass out? And Deborah says, Oh, sad to say, none. I swear it was the funniest trial I ever covered in my life as a reporter. Deadly serious matter, but funny trial. The guy who, uh, uh, pro who basically represented Bowers was this guy on the right. His name is Travis Buckley. Now, he was a lawyer for the Klan, not just Bowers, but a lot of these Klan guys back in the 60s, including Beckwith. And Beckwith was actually convicted in 1975, or was it three? Yes, no, it was for doing it in 73, but 75 is when he's convicted. Was convicted in 75 of uh, basically carrying a ticking time bomb to try to blow up a Jewish leader in New Orleans. I don't know if you knew, knew that or not. Um, and so he actually represented him in that case. Uh, and so he represented a lot of these Klan guys. But the thing you should know, he's not just a lawyer for the Klan. He was a leader in the Klan. He was actually indicted for the firebombing of Vernon Damon back in 1966. So um, he's... You know, so he, we're in the courtroom and the prosecution is kind of laying out its case. And so uh, prosecutor asked uh, Bill Red Pitts about this planning meeting that took place prior to the attack on Vernon Damer's family. He's like, who all was at this meeting, you know? And, and Pitts starts naming them off. Well, I was there. Sam Bowers was there. Devers Nix was there. Travis Buckley was there. And, and, and I looked over at Travis Buckley and just saw no reaction. And then I hear the court reporter, uh, could you repeat those names again? So it's like, uh, uh, Billy Roy, Roy Pitts was there, Sam Bowers was there, Devers Nix was there, Travis Buckley was there. Now Buckley's like, objection, your honor. <laughs> I have a matter I need to take up outside the courtroom. So, uh, you know, I've covered a lot of trials, the only trial I ever covered where a witness implicated the defense lawyer himself, right? <laughs> so not surprisingly, Sam Bowers was convicted in that case and sentenced to life in prison just like Beckwith on August 21st, 1998. But the, but the sad part of this, this is great in, in so many ways, but the sad part of it is that the hate that caused this has yet to go away. Right? Five years ago, a young white man entered this church in Charleston and killed these nine beautiful people. And you know what he was doing? You know why he did that? Because you think these things, what do they have to, how do these things connect? You know what he was doing before he walked in the church and killed these people? He was on a website run by the Council of Conservative Citizens which is a direct descendant of a white citizens council. In fact, you know who told me that? Iron Deal Beckwith. And uh, it, it is. And so what he saw on that website prompted him to, to basically go, go kill. These things continue to happen. A couple of years ago in Pittsburgh, this synagogue was attacked. 11 people were killed because he wanted to destroy the Jews. And last year, in El Paso, 22 people were killed, dozens injured. When uh, this guy, he wanted to protect this country from, quote, an invasion. And you know what's interesting about that? Those are the exact words that Sam Bowers used in the summer of 1964 when he ordered the killings of those three civil rights workers, James Cheney, Andy Goodman, Mickey Shorner. This thing is, history seems to repeat itself, doesn't it? But here's the thing that's interesting to me. Before people hate, they fear, right? And when they fear, you know what they do? They dehumanize which gives them permission to destroy people because people are less than, right? Or they're monsters or whatever they are. There's a great book on this if you're interested in reading it. It's called uh, Faces of the Enemy. 
don't know if you've ever read it, but it's an excellent book by Sam Keen, K-E-E-N. And it, it makes that very point, that, that people, people with their minds, this is what military, this is what armies do. They, they will pass out propaganda to their, their troops so that they're able to go in and, and kill. This is what happens when you start making, turn people into monsters, then you're doing society a service, right? And that's what, that's the thinking. And so people are destroyed either figuratively or literally. And unfortunately, I think we're hearing a lot of that in the, in the political dialogue in this country. Not much dialogue, if you're gonna be real honest. And so um, I've, I've, you know, I've certainly had dozens of death threats and things like that. Had a guy that said he was gonna slip my throat and leave me in the road. And other Klansmen told me that he had pictures of me and knew where I lived. But, the, uh, but it led to kind of an unexpected gift. And, and that is the, the gift of living fearlessly. And living fearlessly is not about living without fear, right? It's about living beyond fear. Living fearlessly is about living for something greater than ourselves. Is that what we see with the civil rights movement? These students that came down, Mega Rivers, Vernon Damer, so many others. I have to say this too about the movement, is I think it's so easy for young people and, and adults to, for the civil rights movement to get reduced to, Rosa Parks sat down, Martin Luther King stood up, and African Americans got their rights. Well, that's ridiculous. Because Rosa Parks, God bless her, do you realize she was not the first woman, African American woman to get arrested in 1955 in Montgomery for refusing to give up her seat. She was the fifth. Isn't that interesting? How often do you hear that? Um, and there's so many local people that were involved. Bernice and so many others and uh, they, they got involved in the movement. And just the, their simple courage of, of getting involved in the movement and doing these things we need to recognize those and honor those folks that, that have done that. As King once said, one day the South will recognize our true heroes, and I'm hoping that we as a nation will recognize our true heroes, people who are involved in the movement. Um, to date now, there have been 24 convictions in these cases, and it's a matter of faith with me, but I believe God's hand's been involved in these cases. Um, but the most amazing thing I've witnessed actually has not been the convictions, it's been some of the racial reconciliation. Not too long after Sam Bowers was convicted, Billy Roy Pitts testified in a hearing. And when he got done testifying, he walked to the back of the courtroom. Oops, sorry. And he ran into Mrs. Damer. And he apologized to Mrs. Damer and asked her to forgive him for killing her husband. And she forgave him. And she began to cry. He began to cry. And isn't that really what we need to do? To be able to be honest about our past, to honest, be honest about the truth of our nation's past. You know, it's so easy to point a finger at Mississippi, and, and you're rightly so, for all these things that happen. But I think we need to be honest about our own places, right? And New York City had one of the worst racial, riot, whatever you want to call it, they call it a riot. I, I wouldn't call it a riot, I call it a massacre. It took place right here of African Americans during what they, what's called locally, what the draft riots, I guess what's what they call them. But um, there's a black orphanage that was burned to the ground during that. And I, I don't know if this is true or not, because I, I haven't, I'm, you know, but I heard there's not even a historical sign for that. There isn't? There's not. There's not a historical sign for that. Why not? Yeah. Fallacy, right? 
Yeah, yeah, we want to think, we want to believe it's all Mississippi, you know. And that's all right. I mean, I'm not saying don't criticize Mississippi. But I find that fascinating. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to leave it open to questions. I do want a couple of commercials before I do. Um, this is my book. And I'm going around. And I'm hoping a few people buy it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a labor of love. And people ask me how long it took me to write the book. And I say 30 years. David knows. <laughs> he's, a, he's known me all this time. And he's been very kind about it. He hasn't asked me about it too much. Uh, but uh, some friends maybe have not been so kind. But, uh, but anyway, I hope at least my hope is that this book, I mean, because this book, I feel like this book's important. Not because of me, because of the stories it tells. And I can't tell you how many people have already read the book so far, black and white. And you know what they said to me after? I never knew all that happened. We don't know our own history. And when we don't know our history, we're condemned to repeat it. We really are. Uh, and I have started a nonprofit, was mentioned earlier. It's uh, Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. We've been really doing some, I feel like, some great reporting. Uh, since we opened the doors January of last year, worked with ProPublica all of 2019 and continue to work on this, investigating prisons in Mississippi. We basically wrote stories saying that uh, these prisons were going to blow up. And they did in December. You know, state officials ignored it, didn't do anything, and that's what's happened. Uh, but this is our website, MississippiCIR.org, and feel free to go on there. I'll give you another example. We reported about underfunding of public education in Mississippi. And I was just kind of curious, um, you know, kind of curious about how much, how much were African-American schools underfunded between Reconstruction and, you know, civil rights era where, you know, schools began to be desegregated. And so I couldn't find that figure anywhere. But I got some help from somebody who knew how to research the data. And I did the math. It's really more of an estimate. But here's how much Mississippi alone underfunded public schools um, for African Americans. $25 billion. B as in, you know, not millions, billions. Isn't that amazing? And I wonder what that fear would be nationally. I mean, I suspect maybe trillions, I don't know. But it would be an interesting project to do. Um, and so we're, I think we're doing some great reporting. Uh, and we are a nonprofit, I can assure you that. Uh, and so if you've got any wealthy relatives or friends, <laughs> or that want to, you know, make sure, you know, in Mississippi, just like here, but especially in Mississippi, Newsrooms are vanishing. They're just going away. And the thing that I think that's really cool about what we're doing is we are literally giving this content to newspapers all across Mississippi, and they are publishing it free of charge from us. So it's running in all, practically all the major newspapers in Mississippi. And it's also running in some online publications as well. So, and it's running The Guardian in London, it's running the US front page of USA Today. So we're very tickled uh, where we are and, and want to continue to try to grow that because Mississippi needs more investigative reporting, not less. So anyway, well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll take it. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, there's like 120 others or more. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, that's the thing that's sad. I mean, I worked, at, you know, I worked on four cases over 16 years, you know, or more than that, actually. Um, and I, I mean, I couldn't begin to get to them all. Yeah, so yes, and that's the other part of the story. Most of these families, the vast majority of these families will never see justice. At this point, 
the suspects are dead or the witnesses are dead. Go ahead. And how did the community, like you said, you can stop, right? How did you oh, yeah. You can't tell? <laughs> yeah, I know. So I'm just saying, how did your community react to you doing this type of work? Oh, yeah. Well, they didn't like it. Yeah, I had uh, my favorite letter to the editor was that the guy said that I should be tarred, feathered, and run out of the state of Mississippi. So I thought, well, at least there's somebody to help me pack, I guess. Anyway, but, yeah, but, yeah, but you're, you're going to get it. I mean, here's the thing, it's the truth, whether you're talking about journalism or anything else, anything worth doing, you're going to have opposition to you. And just know that for the rest of your life. And so doing the right thing is what's important. And, and commit yourself to that, and 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 and, and know you're going to be criticized. In fact, if, when you're doing the right thing, you are going to have people criticize you. And so, yes, I had a lot of criticism. I mean, you know, people calling me up and threatening me, and lots of other things, and calling me all sorts of names. In fact, in fact, it kind of cracks me up because I, if I ever had anybody call me up or bully me around or whatever, try to bully me, that kind of thing, it kind of cracks me up. I'm like. I've been threatened by Klansmen. They're like, what, what are you going to do to me, right? <laughs> you know? And so it helps you live fearlessly, I think, uh, like we are talking about. Thanks for the question. Great question. Hi, thanks again. I, I heard you on the, it was Brian Lehrer's show, uh, one of the others, and I told to myself, you, you're doing God's work. And Thank you. This gentleman, I would really love to thank you, and, and you're absolutely correct in the sense that our country is one in which we are so unaware of our history, and we are. so much of it becomes spin. Yes, so it does. It becomes um, conspiracy well, theory, or they're just making this up. Because exactly. It becomes fake news or yeah, whatever. fake news. So many people didn't yeah. learn it in school, so when they finally learn it at this point, they think that you've got a political agenda. Right, exactly. Which, which is sad. No, it's the truth. Yeah, and, and, I, and I want to say I wish more people like you, and I especially am saying more European Americans were doing this because the whole yeah. notion of, of doing we should. like this, it always becomes all these black people and their issues. And so if some black person right. had written this book, it would be like, oh, there they go again. Exactly. Um, the question I'd like to ask you, just to get to the point, um, I've never understood why. Ku Klux Klan in this country have never been truly labeled legally as a terrorist group. And I understand Amen. what freedom of I speech is. Uh, we all know what freedom of speech is, but we also know what terrorism is. So I've never yeah. understood why they've not been a great movement to push that towards yeah, terrorism. Yeah, I agree with you. And is there anything you can speak on about that? Well, I, there's more recognition of it now, I'd say. I think the FBI has started, has started moving to describing homegrown terrorism. They're actually using the word terrorism now, which I'm glad to finally see. I don't know if you remember this or not, but I remember vividly when the Oklahoma City bombing took place. Um, what happened was immediately, I'm talking about like when it first happened, they were immediately, I, I just remember this so distinctly, the newscast going, oh, I had some expert on there, oh, we can tell this, because remember this was right after the bombing of the um, of, of the Twin Towers, you know, uh, the first one, I'm talking about 93. And so it came right on the heels of that, and it was, anyway, the Oklahoma City bombing did. And so they came on the news and had this expert, oh yes, you can tell this is by, you know, Mideastern bombers, because you can tell by the way the bomb went off and all that kind of stuff. And within two days, they had out the John Doe one, and John Doe, it was a couple of white guys, you know what I mean? And you're going, they stopped moving. They had, I remember that on the news it was like terror in America, you know, and they were calling it terrorism. And, and then when they found it was a couple of white guys, they stopped using the word terrorism. I'm like, why? You know, and that's what it was. It was a blow against, blow against the government, which they, it was very anti-Semitic. It was like they viewed a blow against their government as a blow against the Jews, et cetera, that kind of stuff. So, anyway. Yeah, that's right. The Tulsa, the Tulsa, Tulsa in 1920s. Yeah, yeah. Which was the first time planes were used to bomb America. Yeah, bomb, bomb, the black community was wiped out, and it was one of many. 
that was that was basically Rosewood and many others were uh, were wiped out. She she's got a question. They were both. I mean, in terms of all these cases, there were what two federal cases in Mississippi, and then uh, the Birmingham case was essentially a federal case, but then they brought it over into state court to prosecute it for murder. So, so it, the federal cases were a violation, were two, two, violation two of civil rights. Is that no? Because they were on federal soil. It, weirdly enough, there was one was committed, Ben Chester White was actually killed on federal land, and therefore you could actually use an actual federal murder statute. The other one involved kidnapping, the federal kidnapping charge that resulted in a killing. So they're actually able, uh, Ernest, well, James Seal was convicted and given three life sentences, but one, one would, I think there were two under the kidnapping charge, and then the, uh, there was another charge too. They were able to roll in as well. So. One more thing. There's, sure. there's been a movement, which in fact we would be studying in St. Francis, of public monuments that yes. celebrate um, Confederate soldiers and all those kind well, of things. Yeah, but no, but also but the reverse. The reverse. Is, um, we need to put them up, don't we? <laughs> uh, reverse, which is black heroes and black yeah. history. Does that help? It's a great question. I mean, I think. You know, I'll leave that to society to decide, but I think we need to recognize our true heroes. I mean, to, 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 to go back to the Confederate ones, I'll try to be real quick about this. The, the, you realize, you, you guys probably realize, but down south, there's, there's not an understanding about this. I mean, I saw people argue with me about the reason for the Civil War. You know, they'll, they'll tell me that it was because of states' rights, and I'll go, yeah, right to do what? You know, to own people's property, right? I mean, just read, I just hand them the Mississippi Articles of Secession, you know, which only says slavery like seven or eight times anyway, um, about this is why we're doing it. Um, but, the, but these statues, the Confederate statues I'm talking about, were not built until, like most of them, until the early 1900s. It was a part of the, and in their words, I'm not saying, it, it was a part of the reassertion of white supremacy in the South. And they said this. I'm not. I'm not using my language. Their language. That's their language. And so that was part of it. The Mississippi State flag, for example, it wasn't adopted back in the 1860s. It wasn't adopted until 1894. These statues were typically built some maybe in the 1890s, but most of them in the early 1900s. So it's really fascinating if you look at it. It was part of that lost cause mythology that came to be, and. Uh, which is interesting, but we ought to recognize our true heroes, absolutely. I just think as a society, it's good for society, you know? We got a question from the kids, students. How do you suggest ignorant, ignorant people and why racism is wrong? Wow, great question. Um, well, I mean, that's it, it's ignorance. And, and I think this is where it gets interesting. I think uh, some of the worst racist people I've known it's sometimes I think the, the word ignorant is actually correct. It, I sometimes think people tend to think of, you know, racist as the toothless, you know, rednecks or whatever. Um, actually, some of the worst racists I've known are pretty intelligent, which might surprise you, but they're intelligent, but they're ignorant, right? And how do you, you I, I don't know that I have a good answer for this other than you try to inform people. A lot of it is based on fake news. Like people believe, you know, I, I give a, a ridiculous example, this is a, but like you've got people out there actually, well, did I read the other day the numbers had actually increased of the people who denied the Holocaust, said the Holocaust didn't happen? I saw a poll, I think a poll said the numbers in that had actually risen, I'm like, how does that happen? But well, we've got to do a better job of teaching these things. And um, I think the Holocaust Museum ought to be almost required for everybody to go through that. Is that it's an incredibly moving place. And if you're in Mississippi, I think the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum is just terrific. 
And uh, they've just done a wonderful job, I think, of, of telling the story of these local people we're talking about uh, who, who, whose names aren't known. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a tough thing because if they've kind of made up their minds, it's it's tough. But a lot of times it's based on disinformation or uh, rather than true information. They'll say like things like, "Oh, the Jews own all the the, the you know the the networks or something like that," which is just a lie. But that's you know that's that's the kind of stuff people often believe racist stuff anyway. Anyway. Well, I, I, I certainly know him, and I've, I've had you for program and stuff like that, but we, I kind of work together with them in a sense. I mean, I'm not necessarily working directly with them, but I work with them in a sense of information, and they've done a great job. If you've been through the lynching museum, yeah, it's an excellent, excellent museum. If you ever, if you make your way to Montgomery, Alabama, the, she's referring to Brian Stevenson, the, it's an excellent museum, very moving. Peace and Justice Memorial, I think so it's technically called. But it's basically every county, the, the names of those who were lynched in uh, every county. Go ahead. So um, my question to you is, you could have wrote in or investigated pretty much anything in this world. So what exactly struck you to investigate murders of the six? Well, I think what drove me more than anything else was, um, you know, these were kind of injustices at their height, at their height, because it wasn't just that these guys got away with murder, it was the fact that every, it was an open secret, everybody knew they got away with murder. And that was, I, I injustices have always bothered me. And that just bought, that was kind of the height of it. Anyway, go ahead, Hello. or Bernice. Hi. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bernice Sims. I'm from Mississippi, Meridian, Mississippi. And as Jerry said, I'm very closely related to one of the first cases he mentioned. Uh, Michael Slaughter, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney were my neighbors, colleagues, and friends. And I was with them on the day before they were uh, eventually murdered by the clans in Sherwood County in, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, and I'm going to expound on her question because I was That's wondering right. uh, what couple of things, what motivated you, was there anything specific that motivated you to investigate these cases and to write about yeah. so vividly, uh, and I follow you on Facebook, I don't like the Facebook that much, but <laughs> I, certain people draw me in and I usually want to know yeah. uh, the information that you offer. Yeah, history. I should tell people that, that uh, every day I post kind of today in civil rights history. So if, you're, if that interests you, you can follow me. I think I've got it on, back on the other page. Anyway. Almost anything that you want to know about in terms of African American history, this is the expert and then anything you need to know. Thank you for the work that you do. Uh, yes. I'm so appreciative. Um, and I was just wondering, a couple of things I said. Sure. What, what motivated you to want to take this as, a, as such a passion and interest? Because it's right. obvious it's there. Yeah. And the other thing, do you, do you share, did you have much in common with William Bradford Huey, that wrote that first <laughs> book, Three Lies from Mississippi? Uh, and did so. you know him? <laughs> no, I didn't know Huey. He was dead by the time I sort of working on this. We, we can get a whole long discussion about Huey, but anyway, uh, I'll save that for later. But um, I kind of feel like, this was a, a, a quote attributed to Fannie Lou Hamer, which was, um, she was asked, why did you choose to get involved in the movement? And her answer was, I didn't choose it, it chose me. And that's kind of the way I feel. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, it wasn't like I entered this going, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this, you know? <laughs> it was like a series of circumstances that, um, and I, you know, I, I, I am a person of faith and I, I do believe in that. And so 
I just think I was led down this road and for whatever reason kind of called to do this. Does that make sense? Yeah. I understand that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Behind you. Oh, one more question. Yes. I was with Byron Deal Beckwith. I mean, uh, it was awful. It was just so horribly racist, I actually found myself laughing a lot. I uh, was so absurdly racist, if that makes any sense. Yes, go ahead. Any other questions? Oh, we have a lot. Yes, we right here. here. Oh, yeah, lots of questions. Yeah. Where do we have an audience? Right here, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Um, so, please take a second to think about this. Sure. What advice would you give to a student who's working towards becoming an investigative journalist? Um, and working on similar stories, um, what can they do, yeah. do now to make sure their words are read and heard and taken seriously? That's a great question. The, the best advice in journalism, and this is advice I've learned, is be persistent. Don't give up. And I, I think that's true, should be true for probably all, anything you decide to do, whether journalism or not. It's so easy to give up. And, um, you know, I remember I wanted to, during, the, when I was investigating the, you know, the killings of, of Cheney W. Schwerner, I, I mean, there was a point in time I, I, I you know, was a, you know, it was pretty discouraging, I'll put it that way. And, uh, and I remember uh, going and visiting James Cheney's grave. And what it says is there are those who are alive, yet will never live, those who are dead, yet will live forever. Great deeds inspire and encourage the living. So, great words for us. Great words for us. And so whatever you do, and I hope you do go into journalism, I think it's, I believe journalism is one of the world's most noble professions. Because we traffic in truth. We are about truth. And truth is what helps lead to justice. And even if justice is impossible, we can still tell the truth. So, uh, I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll continue to present. Feel free to stay in touch with me. And um, wish you the best. Wish all of you the best in whatever you decide to do in uh, your life or the rest of your life, whatever you do. Thanks. Oh, one more question. One more, then one more. Okay. Um, being a journalist, um, would you ever like consider to keep on doing what you do? Like look, continue looking for justice? Yeah. Would, would I consider working with people that are looking for justice? Would you like continue what you do? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. That's what we're doing with the nonprofit. We're trying to, justice isn't just what happens in the courtroom. Justice is about how we treat each other, right? We can't have a different set of justice for people just because of their skin color, or just because of their, they're poor, or whatever the situation is. Um, we can't do that. I mean, that's that's wrong. You know, you gotta be fair. Yeah. One final one. Okay. Why do you see or suggest that someone seek what is really accurate or truth in journalism? Great question. I mean, um, we seek to get at truth. It doesn't mean we're ever entirely successful, but we try to chip away at you. I mean, there's such a thing as truth. A lot of times, I mean, like if if someone's murdered, somebody did it. I mean, you know what I mean. I mean, there are just different things like that that you can determine that are true, and you try to build on that. You kind of work on that and and, and move toward truth. And that's what we're talking about the history. I think that's why the history is so important. It's until we recognize our true history that we can really understand and begin to move forward. Because if we don't, then we're going. Oh well. I, you know, my family never owned slaves. <laughs> you know, I've heard that from plenty of people in the South. My family never owned slaves. Like, that has something to do with it, you know? And, um, and so that, that's what we want to do. We want to get as, as close as we can to actual truth. And it's, it's a process. It doesn't always happen overnight. So anyway, may God bless you. Thanks so much for having me today. Appreciate it.